Rawr. Shut up, dog. Rawr, rawr. You can give me all your trouble. Well, I'm not interested in all this. I don't care. I don't care where they are. I'm only interested in the feeding fish and where they are, what depth are they at and what bait do they want. And that's the only thing I think about fishing. I don't, I'm not a complicated fisherman. It either works or it doesn't. I've no fit what I call fairies in my head or anything like that. It works or it doesn't. If it don't work, get rid of it. So that's what I'm trying to do. So, first of all, prepare my bait. So I come to a commercial fishery. First thing I do, I check, do we have to use their pellets? If we've got to use our feed pellets, it's no problem, you go and buy them, you've got to have pe pellets anyway. And I prepare them in the way that I want to prepare them. For example, I'll get a bag of pellets, I like to colour some of mine, and I use a Sensei dyes and liquids to colour them. But if, it's, if, if the pellets on the fishery are not, and you can bring any, it's quite simple. Like all I've done, in literally two or three minutes, all I've done, I've got a squeeze ready bag of pellets which are out now. Straight out of bag like that, they're, they're softened for you. The squeeze up so you can put them on a feeder without doing anything. And you put them in there, and all I've done, oh, I love. I have dyed them, I could have, I could use a Sensei dye and dyed some up in different colours. Or I could use our two in one, three mils, like that, two mil, three mils. And I, but I love them, I love to mix them in. So all I've done, I've mixed some of them in. With, with, nat with natural pellets. The squeeze ready pellets and natural pellets soaked up already for you. Just buy the bag, open it and you can use them. And all I've done, I've prepared my bait in literally a minute. Because all I've done, I've put squeeze ready in there, I've got some of them, mixed them in, and I like a different mixture. So my, my bait's done. I don't have to worry about messing about, get hands mucky, dirty, coloured, whatever, it's all ready. And then my up baits, all I'm going to be doing, I've got some different coloured 5 mils, 2 in 1's 5 mils which I like to use, or what I've done, I've got, I've got these, I've got a refill sinker in a 4 and a 6, which is just a nice soft pellet, very similar to 2 in 1's, but you get different brighter colours, they're a bit brighter, you can pick the ones out that you want. And all I've done, I've just opened that, and I've just, oh. put, them and I've just put them in a tub where I can pick them out. I'm ready for fishing. That's the beauty about Volker Bay is you don't have to do lots and lots of preparation, they're making it easy for you just to go fishing. So basically in two minutes I'm ready to go fishing. I don't need no else, I'm all ready, all done, simple. But that's the beauty and that's what sold Volker to me when David said to me, he says, I'm going to show you this bait and it's to make fishing simple. And there aren't many anglers uh, that, that got it originally but I got it instantly, so that's the idea. And the extra thing is, we we'll go around the country and we we'll, we'll get demonstrations now about about fishing as well. So my bait's done. Simple. You don't have to mess about. Now then, so what we're going to do? We're going to fish on the bottom. And two things that stand out really when you're fishing on the bottom, which I'm going to explain to you and show you. Lots of anglers are obsessed with feeding. Sorry, are obsessed with feeding too much. And what happens when you feed too much, you get too many fish in your peg, you foul up them, you get false bites, you get bubbles coming up. You'll see it in a minute when we go out there. Once you get bubbles in your peg, you have a bit of a problem. So what I'm going to do is try and, uh, and help you with that. And, and the next biggest thing is that. That bit of line there. It's one of the biggest problems anglers have. So they're the two things. Everything else I can show you, I can teach you. So first thing is elastics. Let's talk about elastics. Now, when I'm fishing in elastic, I balance the elastic to the hook. That's what I try to do, because some venues I go on, it's all carp. Some venues I go on, it's all F1s. Some venues I go on, it's a mixture. So what I try and do is, is, is balance the elastic to the hook that I'm using. So, for example, the easiest way is to start at a 14 hook, I use a 14 elastic. If I use, if I want a, uh, a 16 hook, it'll be a 12 elastic. And if I want an 18 hook, it'll be a 10 elastic. In other words, I know that hook is balanced to that elastic. You can't put a 16 with a 20 elastic, it'll just wear out and, and you'll bump fish all day long. So I've learned that the balance is that. And if you just base it on a 14 hook, 14 elastic, and then work backwards or other way around. So that's all that I do. 
But the length of elastic is what people get wrong more than anything. For example, in there you can see there's puller kits which are the modern day thing which you can use or don't use, but it's always there if you need to use it. But it's the tension inside the elastic that most people get wrong. They usually have it too tight because they want it to go back in on its own like that. But I do. What I try and do, I put the elastic in and when I pre-stretched it, I, I fix that end first, I put a loop in it, put it on the door, pull it and I get all the pre-stretch out. When it goes back, I just cut it there and put a knot in it straight away that goes onto me, my little bead. So in other words, when it's done, it's about that long. It's about two inches shorter than that, so that it just goes back on its own. Because I want the elastic to work with the fish. If, you, if I cut it so it's there, if you can imagine there's that much elastic in, it's really tensioned up then and what happens it goes DONG! Like that. If it goes like that you might as well use the next grade of elastic cut because that's what you've cut it down to be. You've made it too strong, it just wants to go back on its own. And it's easy done, all you do, set it up from that end first, put a loop in there, put it in the house door, or get somebody to pull it, take the pre-stretch out, and then when it comes back you just get the knot there which is the knot that holds your bead on and just do it there and it's about two inches less and it just goes back and it's nice and that's what you're looking for. Now then the floats. Why is it floats always get anglers? They get me so I know they get you. Right? You can't go in a shop without buying a float right? and they're all nearly the same. <coughs> they're probably the same as the ones you bought last week and that week or four but we can't resist it, I can't resist it, we, we all like it and it, but basically there's only two shapes of floats that's any good. One is that, what I call for quick fishing and the other one's like a rugby ball, upside down rugby ball. Them's the only two shapes, you look at every look at them all and they're all the same, they're just different colours and the different manufacturers to catch you out and they do, because they catch me out. Right, I've got more floats than you can believe. But it's what, you, it, what happens to the float ball than any, anything. Three rubbers on, one under the body, one in the middle, that stops it from bending, and one just overlapping, you can see it just overlapped, and that's so the line comes through centre. So three rubbers like that, and that's all that you need. Does it need to be a wire bottom, fiberglass, carbon? It, if I'm on a river, I like a, a, a solid one, like a steel one. But if I'm on a still water like here, it's either carbon or in this case it's fiberglass. It do not really make any difference. I don't. The trouble is with steel, it steel holds it more buoyant. But when you've got a steel bottom on, it's heavy, so it makes your float body bigger. So your float body is bigger. It might take the same shot, but because your float body is bigger, it means it'll move more with the wind. And that's why I don't like steel bottom, because it makes the body bigger for the same size shotting pattern that you do. Now then, but this is where the nitty gritty is, what it's all about. Now you can see I've got a 6 inch up length, on here I've got a 16 to over 16 because I'm mainly fishing for carp, and then loop to loop. I always do a loop to loop, it's not the best knot, but it's the most practical. For example, if you have a problem you can change your hook and everything like that. Loop to loop, so if I want to change the hook or I have a problem and it breaks me or whatever, it's quicker and easy to change that hook, simple. Then above the loop to loop, the first shot, which is a number 10. Number 10 stop. Don't use shot on a commercial, use stops. They don't ping off. What happens is with shot, when it stretches, when you've got a carp on, it pings off. So I'll just use a 10 stop. So if you're above 4 foot deep now, your next shot is 6 inches above that, which is a number 10 again. So two 10s, and then 6 inches above that is the rest of the shot that cocks the float, which is what we call the bulk. So basically you've got 6, 6, 6, the devil's number, that's all that you've got to remember. And if you remember that 6, 6, 6, that's all you need. You'll see how people talk about all the fancy rigs and this, that and other, they'll put a shot there and everything like that. 6, 6, 6 is the best way of shotting. Now if it's under 4 foot deep, obviously you can't, if it's 3 foot deep, you can't go 6, 6, 6. So go 4, 4, 4. And there's the only two, two numbers that I use, 666 or 444. Four. And, and there's a rule on, like I used to carry a ruler about with me and measure it, but I've, you've got one on the side of your bait tray and everything now. If you haven't, just put one on there so it's always available. And eventually you get used to that anyway, 666. And that's all that you need.
and that's my setup. Simple. So basically, that's my setup. It's as simple as that. But that's not important. As important, sorry, it's important, but not as important as that. Now, one thing you might get from today is is it's going to rain for a start off, right? And secondly, is you'll get more fishing time in the water. What I'm going to show you now because of that length of line. Because what happens is, when you have a longer length of your line, it does two things. When it's windy, there's a bit of wind on today, it blows it, so it blows your float off, mark like that, you can't control it. But when you strike, because you've got to pick that line up, you strike, and all your rig comes out of water, which usually knocks your bait off, or your foul look of fish. Which means you've got to come back, you've got to put an up bait on, you've got to fill your pot in again, you've got to go back out and start fishing again. But what I'm going to show you is how to stop all that so that you're getting more fishing time in the water. Now then, you can see I've got a little pot on. When I was a kid, when I was, when I was their age, I learned that the best way of feeding was little and often. And in 50 years time, when I'm dead and gone, it'll still be the best way of feeding, little and often. It always has been and it always will be. So when I take people coaching, I'll say how do you feed it? They've always got a big pot set up at side. Well, always. Every, everybody's got one of them, honestly. And I go, what do you do? Well, I fill that up and I go like that and I tip it in. Right, smashing. So the tip, all that in, is three offerings for the fish. I mean, look at it. I can't get it on my hand. That's what they do. You wouldn't believe if you went to how many anglers do that, and some of you all probably do, and it's the worst thing you can do. It's the worst thing you can do. Because what happens is, you've got lots of free offering, the carp comes in and goes, one day we're knocking it, I'm not checking that, I'll have all these freebies. So the, the gorge itself, which brings other fish in, and other fish in, you get that many fish, fish in your peg, you can't get them to pick your up bait up, and it's happened to you all, I know it has. Right, so the idea is to catch a feed, catch a fish, feed, catch a fish, feed, catch a fish, feed, catch a fish. That's the key. So, so we've got, we're going to cut that out. There's different sized pots. Question on that, if I may. Yeah. Um, you're saying that's wrong, but I'm going to put the question. Let's say I do that, but I'm not going to fish there for three, four hours. Is it still wrong? Well, you, yeah, you just fit the way. Still you, wrong. You still, the only time I would do that is if I'm fishing the outside and I won't do it for three hours. Right? Because then I want them to come in. When I'm going to the fish, you don't have to feed them. When I want the fish to come to me, then you have to feed them. So usually the fish in the side are not there, so you feed them and feed them and wait for them to come in. If you're going out there fishing, you're going to the fish. Yeah. And when you're going to the fish, you don't have to put a lot of bait in you because that's where the fish are already at. It's used as an attractor. So, so basically, you get different pots. Now this one, right, who, who thinks this is a big pot? Anybody? Nobody thinks that's a big pot. I right? Do. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> you're really awkward, that's why. <coughs> right? So these are five mil pellets, right? So you yeah, don't think that's a big pot. Them's five mil pellets, right? <laughs> what do you want to feed all them for? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six, twenty-eight, thirty, thirty-two, thirty-four, thirty-six, thirty-eight, forty, forty, forty-four. It's 44 pellets there. Now if they were just normal fours, there'd be 72. So I've counted them, I know how many goes in. Right, but even the five mils is 44 pellets there. And you don't think it's a big pot. Right? You think that's a small pot? Yeah? Right. I know David, David does. Right? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty-one. Why would you feed twenty-one pellets? Look at the size of that. But we do. Right? But that's in the winter. 
one, there's two in. That's where you fish it winter. And that can kill it. So what I'm saying to you is, think about how much bait you put in. It's the biggest single mistake anglers make. They feed too much. They feed too much in one go. I'm not saying you're not going to feed all that. I'm going to feed all that, but not in one go. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put it in as an attractor, catch one, then I'm going to feed again. So I'll get rid of all that, but during the day. That's the idea. And that's what you've got to do. So, we've got his bait, we've got his tackle, we've got his setup. Now, obviously, I plumbed this up, but I'm going to show you about plumbing now. But that, to me, is a big pot. You can't believe that I'm thinking that's a big pot. I've just shown you 44 pellets. How many micros is there? You know, so exactly. And the idea is to get it right and catch a fish. Remember, little and often, it's always and always will be. You go watch the these anglers on commercials now. They'll be at Lindholm last week. We had a competition, and the caught I think winning two is normal. They caught twelve hundred pound in five days fishing, and they'll be feeding little all the time, little and often through the peg. That's all they'll be doing. And that's uh, the, 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 not once will they gone with a great big pot, unless, like I said, it's inside to catch one later on. So now, so I've got to this position, I've come to my peg, and when you're fishing on the bottom, obviously the most important thing is, is to find out where the bottom is. Now, so, <coughs> first thing is, get a nice size plummet, put it down somewhere. Sorry, before we go, I need to talk about something else. But, right. Talked about swim management. So when I come to a commercial fishery, first thing I do, I'm looking at the peg. And in the summer, this time of the year, when it's when it's warmer, <laughs> right? I, what I want is two things. I want the wind blowing at me. That's first thing. In the summer, wind blowing at me. In the winter, wind off my back. But there's one thing that I'm looking for is this. In the summer, I like to start long, finish short. In other words, as long as I can go and finish in the edge. But in the winter, the fish want to be, they don't want much food. So you start short and follow them and finish long. Now short might be 10, 11 metres, but you start as short as you can and then work away, because what happens is they back off the feed. So them's two of my rules. In the summer, start long, finish short. So but there's one line, there's one line that summer and winter I always fish and it's called two plus two. Top two with plasticated plus two. It's one of the most important lines in match fishing any time of the year. And it's one line, no matter, I might stop feeding out, but I'll never ever stop feeding at two plus two because it does two things to me. It's a great line and it's usually at the bottom of ledges at fisheries. But what it does, it brings the fish in from far to the edge. So it's somewhere to tempt them in before they come into the edge. And what happens is I not, normally don't pick that up for two or three hours. But when you pick it up, and, it, and you pick it up, you go in, and if it doesn't go first cast or even second cast, bring it back, they're not there. But the moment it goes with the fish, you can usually catch there for a while, because they've already moved in. So it's a really important line. So when I... So that's the line I'm going to show you. So when I'm feeding it, right now, because it's just that length, you can feed it all the time. So even if it's your tip, like David, you can sit there watching your tip, and you can feed your line. So you always, so because it's comfortable for that line. So, put a plumbing tam. And there's a couple of things on the You swing it out, and what I'm looking for are ledges. Because I want ledges, I want to find ledges. In most places you can't, you can't find them where you have to fish it from the bottom on the flat. The trouble is with the flat, I know it's silt. And when you get silt, they'll fizz and they'll blow. Once it fizz and blow, they're out to catch. 
So first thing is I like to plug with tool tool and I always go to end the elbow so when you hold the pole that's the strongest part and that's where your elbow wants to be. I see lots of angles like that but that's the weakest part and your elbow's a nightmare and that's where they break the pole. And that's where they crack them there. So always ship, it does two things, one is the strongest part on the ferrule, it's also a great marker. But you go up, oh, can't feel it, so that tells me you're always going to the same spot. So all I do then, I lower it down, and what am I looking for? First of all, bottom. Right, I've already set this up. So all I'm going to do, when I find the bottom, is then what's there? I've gone out a foot, I hit a cart then, and I've tried to set plummet a lot. <laughs> And you do that, and I can see now, and I go round the spot, and I can see that it's fairly flat. I'm sat up when I'm in fish, fishing position, because what you do, elbow, end of pole, into your hip like that, and you're always on the, on the same mark. And I'm looking for a marker then that I'm going to use. And what I'm going to use, I'm going to use that tree. So all, I'm all, because it's smack in front of me, I can see, now that, what I want to know now, is there a ledge? So I come in a foot, another foot, and it's flat. Right, it's nice and it's flat. So there's no ledge. I'm going to keep coming in. Now I started coming up. It's not really a ledge. It's just it's just like a really silty one. But where I want to fish, it's flat. Now, if I was fishing in that area where I can just underarm my bait and there was a ledge, what I would do, I'd pull back up the ledge six inches because there's no silt. It's solid. And when the fish picks the bait up and you fall it, it'll be on. But the moment you'll go into silt, when you get bubbles, the fish go into the silt to stir it up, that's when you power up the fish in the water. So, when I get to this position, what am I looking for? Well, it's quite simple. So when I'm plumbing, I'm on the silt, I want to plumb to the bottom of the bristle. And when I've shot, it's going to be half a bristle. So I've got half an inch on the deck. But when I'm on a slope that's like that, I like to plumb it to the bottom of the body. Because when you go to the bottom of the body on, on a thing, what happens is, if you were there and you hold it there, you're a different depth. Even if you go like that with your body, you're at a different depth. So what I do, I always fish it just over like that, so I've got a little bit of sway about that much. So that, because what will happen is, when it goes on the slope, it won't lay on the bottom that extra line, the pellet of the bait will go and it'll go direct. And it just, your float will just move backwards and forwards over that two or three inches, and it'll be, it'll finish up like that, where your bait's touching the bottom and your, your float's perfect. You'll always do that. So you can put it over just to give you a little bit of compensation. Because what happens if you put six inches on, it'll just move out. It'll just move out until, until the pellet and the, and the flow of balance will move backwards and forwards. So just give yourself a little bit of security. So that's, all, that's and I keep it as simple as that. So when I shot up, I want half a bristle, but when I plumb up and it's flat, I come to the bottom of the bristle. And, and the rule is, when you get getting bites and you're missing a few, just take half an inch off until you start hooking them. So if, if you're not getting bites, you can put more depth on. If you're missing bites, take it off. And I'm ready for fishing now. So what I'm going to show you is a couple of setups and, and little tips just to help you not get into trouble. So first thing is, I'm fishing away now. The shouted time. The first thing is to put my hook bait on. And in this case, I'm just going to put a going to put a, don't matter what I'm going to put a brown in them. Take them See this way, it? And all I'm going to do is when I hook a pellet, I just get the pellet and there's a lack of a barrel on a flat bit. And when I'm fishing the hook, I like to put it in the flat bit, put it in like that, just turn it on so the pellet's on. Simple. Now then, what I do then, to avoid getting tangles, because you've got your keep nets in front of you, all the rubbish is in front of you, how many times have you dropped your rig in the side, fill your pot up, and you've, oh yeah, I can see you all smiling, <laughs> right, 
Yeah. I've done it. We've all done it. Well, you'll never, it'll never happen again after today. Trust me. Right? Is you drop it in, fill your pot up, ship like that. You hook your keep net, or you've hooked some rubbish or something like that, and you come back in. Your pot fills out, and you're swearing and cursing. The easiest way to do that is to ship that up your line, which creates a bow, and then you can get your pellets and you can dip them in, just press it a little bit, not too firm, you don't want it to come out thing. go back down a bit, but always create this V, so that when you start fishing, it goes like this, you let it go, and that weight, then that bolt, watch what it does, it's past all the key vets, and you'll never up the key vets again. So the next thing is you put your pole together, like now in my head I'm thinking this, this is a routine that I think, First of all, I don't even think about the reef, I'm thinking about elbow. Elbow is a pole. I look at the elbow, there's a pole. I look at my mark and I'm going to be fishing to the bottom of the reef, yeah. And I think, and what I'll do, I'll just stick that over, I touch the water, I lift it up, tap it, it come out because it's just going to be good because it took time and it's out. Now then, I'm in the fishing position. The rig now will swing under and I touch the bottom of the float with the water and I hold it for 10 seconds, it's called 10 second roll right, because then what happens is you fed under the rod end your rig is now in a straight line under that rod end with all that bait on the bottom so your hook bait should be exactly where your feed is and all you do then, let it go to the fish like that now you've got that short line and the idea of that short line is this if I get a bite I've missed it, but I'm still fishing. If you do that, which most people do, you'll be bait comes off. But even if it doesn't, you've got to come back all way and you've got to start again. And trust me, if the fish is on, that little lift, your elastic will be out, hopefully, we'll be able to do it. And then you're back to feeding pattern like that. Let it go, straight past all your keep nets and all your rubbish. Put your rig together, take this time, elbow, elbow, what I'm thinking now is elbow, 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 line it up, into my hip, line it up, touch water, lift it up, pop, 10 second rule. Just 10 second rule, my hook bait then is in the feed, and that's all that I'm trying to do. When you've got your 10 seconds, longer than you think by the way, 10 seconds, you're fishing. Now it's amazing, when the fish are actually feeding, and you've been doing it for a while, obviously we're just starting this, right, what happens is, the fish will be waiting for it, and you won't believe how many times you do that, you lower it and it goes straight on the, and this one on. But of course it's it'd be more difficult today, we've just started, see that were an indication, so the fish are coming to the bay, and all I'm waiting for now is for it to go under, and if it goes under, one of the most important things for me as, as a match angler especially, is more fishing time in the water and that's what I'm trying to do see bubbles coming up now what that is, that's the bait's gone in on the silt the fish now are in the silt trying to get the bait I think last year, I'm sure it was last year up the town we had it like a jacuzzi and uh, there you go but I'm fishing again I've missed it, I haven't struck the bait off and I'm fishing again what I'm trying to do is get the maximum amount of time off that one feed that's what I'm trying to do, is get as much time as I can on one feed. And there's a time, not the skim of that, there'll be a time when you go, and, and I'm sure you'll be asking a question of how long do you leave if you don't catch a fish? Well, only time can help, but at this time of the year, probably five minutes. See, that's fish, that's a liner, small fish. Roll Let me talk, I haven't talked about rollers yet. <laughs> Somebody's not going to be able to give me a tip after that. But again, you're back to routine. Same routine, and once you get the right routine, you see, I didn't even fill that up. I'm only three quarter filled it, and I'm trying to get the fish in the peg. Tom, can I ask? Yeah? If, if it's, it's fizzing a lot, then obviously they're, they're digging their heads in. How often would you plumb if it, if it gets like a jacuzzi? Because obviously they're going to dig a... You're not going to be on the bottom, are you? 
No, no, sometimes I'll, I'll go to it right. I'll go to it. Oh, I see. If it's I'll, flat. Yeah. If it's if I think I'm if I think I'm missing too many bites. Yeah. I'll put plumb it back on and I'll plumb where I've gone. You you won't believe the hollow that yeah. pulled out. But if you go foot to it right or left, you'll be surprised. Yeah. That it, that they haven't done it there. They only do it where you feed. Yeah. Where, where you're feeding. Thank you. You can you can actually uh, tell um, uh, we anglers where they've been fishing. You know by plumbing up. Yeah. We're a roach angler. Even roach like folk, you see. <laughs> but no, getting fizzing sometimes is a nightmare. Mm. And, and, and that's why I look for, especially in a commercial, I look for ledges. But when you haven't got a pronounced one, I mean, this one just comes up gradual. And that's, that's just the silt that's built it up. But when it was built, it might have been like that. And what happens is all the silt runs down to the bottom, so if you're on a proper slope, it's it's hard and you, you don't miss bites then when the float goes under you, it's on. Yeah. But silt is, is one of the worst things. What, you, what you'll find out when you've been feeding is the fish get used to it. They'll, they'll, get, they'll get used to when you feed and everything like that. You haven't mentioned the shotting weight and the float. Is that important? Good question, right, I haven't. Right. The simple rule to that is I like to fish as light as I possibly can to the conditions. And of course the depth comes into it. For example, it's flat calm today, so I can put this is like a like a 4 bit 12s really. Uh, I, I won't use anything 414s. But if it were windy, you'd be you'd be made to use a bigger one. So it's and if it's deeper. But it's about it's, a, it's about the conditions. All I say is, fish as light as you possibly can to the conditions, because you look more fish. Like like if it was like I've got probably a four by twelves on today, I think it is. But if it were a foot deeper, it'd be a four fourteens, because that float would be right for that particular depth. Now, next thing is, I'm sat there and I'm looking at my float. And obviously there's a lot of people that's just going to be able to, to get a carp to come in. But if I think, you can always tell, like I've lifted up and I've missed one. But I think they've had all that bait now. I think they've had all that bait. And if I sat there, sat there, and you might think, well, you should, why don't you just put more in? But I'd sooner feed again. So, what I, because I think I caught roach, I think they're eating it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to come back in. For a, again, i go straight to routine. Routine. Right, you can throw questions at me now if you want, if anybody's got any. Elbow, elbow, line it up, feed, 10 seconds. And that 10 seconds is really important. Because if I didn't, if I, if I went like that, right, Watch what happens with the float. I've fed there. It's this side of my float. What? <laughs> <laughs> what do I know? Yeah. But that. But I'm trying to get my my hook bait in with that. Like a method. You wouldn't chuck a method feeder out and bring it back two foot, would you? Because your bait's two foot away. Then you you want the fish to come in and eat all your bait up. And and your hook bait's in the middle, and that's what you're trying to do on a float. Told about these ropes, but it don't matter. The main thing is we're catching. Is Are they all top the lip, Tom? Tom? Hey? Are they all in the top lip? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? You're not using a back shot then. Right, it's a good question that. It's something I don't use a lot, except when it's really windy. I try not to use one, um, but some anglers have sh longer lines that they have shot on on the line to hold it still, I just don't get that at all, I really don't, but you know, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying my way is right or wrong, what I'm saying is my way, and other people have different ways, and I, I'm not going to argue with good anglers that do that, but when I use a back shot in, I use a back shot like three inches away from the hook, uh, from the, the float, uh, so 
on the frog field. So now you're just the perfect at the top when the shallow pitch and so on there. And, uh, and I use one to hold it still. But the trouble is with that is you've got to have a longer line on because it don't work well. So what happens is you miss more bites. But when it's windy, it holds the float still. It's miles better. So yes, I do use one, but I use it when I think it's windy or the conditions allow me to. And I always find it's better with F1s than car. But that again, I'm fishing. I'll be honest with you, it's one of the hardest things to do, not to strike, to lift, but what you do, you get more fishing time in water, it's one of the biggest things. <laughs> Any questions? Come on, throw them at me. You seem to have a lot of float out of the water. Like chip, yeah, it can't, it can't settle, that's all. No. It, it, um, there you go. When you get one, right, you just, just hold it like that and watch the elastic. One of the biggest things anglers do, they go like that. But you want to see what's happening with the elastic. I want to see where the fish is. So when it's out like that, I don't move the pole. I hold it, I hold it, I hold it. And I'm watching the angle of the flow. What I'm trying to do then is wait for it to come in. Now it's coming in, so the fish is swimming. So you can swim and get it into the shipping position as quick as you can. Now then. It's, going to, it's a carp, it's going to swim round inside, like that, and I've got a pullable. Now, a lot of anglers, these young match anglers are just the different leagues. They go like that straight away, and I'm like, whoa! <laughs> but I, I'm old school, I get that, but I only do it when I have to. So all I do now is take my time. I'll tell you what, I'll get my landing there. Take my time. I usually have me landing it on top of my keep net there. At the end of the day, right, they're hard enough to get on. So if it goes to my left, you put your rod to the right and it turns it and brings it back like that. And then if it goes that way, you pull it that way and it turns it round. In other words, you're in control of what it wants to do. And then just take your time, let the elastic do the work, let it swim round. And take your time, it's not, it's not a race, is it? Now, if you want, what I do sometimes, when I'm fishing further out, I, I don't like to do it if I'm fishing this method, but I might pick some pellets up at the same time and feed me two plus two. I don't if I'm fishing it, but if I'm fishing long and I'm catching or down the edge and I want to keep it going, you just keep throwing some bait in like that, and that keeps that swim going as well. So just take your time. And when you get it there, And if you think it's going out, just put it low, see how it's turned and come back. You can, con you can nearly control the fish. You know when, if you catch something of like, I mean that's a nice size, but something a bit big, ain't it? Yeah. And it lunges off. Yeah. What do you do then, especially if it's going away from you? Just hold it, just hold just, your pole, let yeah. the elastic do the work. Okay. That's the idea of the elastic. I see people putting sections on, but the more sections you want, they go further quicker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Basically, they just, go, they just go further quicker. Let the elastic do the work. So when you get a fish... That's a nice fish. Right like that. You shout. Fuka! Fuka! <laughs> so I caught that on a, a six mil sinker. <laughs> I shouted that and got kicked off. That's a lovely fish, that, isn't it? It's gorgeous. Look at that. I wanted it, got it. Oh, I don't need a look. <coughs> I've got to drop it down. It just looks funky. 